This video is part of the MCAT Chemistry video course. Subscribe if you'd like notifications about the release of new videos, and please visit ancientbrainstutoring.com for questions about one-on-one -on -one virtual MCAT tutoring. In this video, we'll go over calorimetry, and first we'll talk about the different types of systems, and then we'll go over actual bomb calorimetry. A system is a term that we give local environments, and whatever we decide to define as a system is pretty much up to us. So you could choose the human body to be a system, you could choose a house to be a system, you could choose the earth to be a system, and whatever you decide on what your system is, within that system you have all kinds of chemical interactions and processes. So a system can be pretty much anything, and we use these three terms to describe the behaviors and characteristics of different types of systems. First, an open system can exchange matter and energy with its surroundings. So if we look at the human body, for example, we can easily see that the human body exchanges matter with the surroundings, and that's just as simple as breathing and eating and waste. And for energy, just think about does the human body gain energy from the surroundings? And one really easy example you could think of would be light. So if you sit under light, you will notice that you get warmer, and that is because there's an exchange of energy due to those photons. And the human body also gives energy to the surroundings, and that can be shown just as simply as if you put your hand on a surface and then take your hand away, that area that your hand was on is now a little bit warmer. So you gave energy to the surroundings. So the human body would be a very easy example of an open system. Some other ones you may not think about would be the earth. So the earth exchanges matter with the surroundings and the surroundings would just be space. And the earth gets and gives up energy as well. The sun gives earth energy via electromagnetic radiation and then the earth also loses heat to the surroundings. The next type of system is a closed system. And a closed system exchanges energy with the surroundings, but it does not exchange matter. So a closed system, you want to think about what type of things do not allow atoms or molecules to leave or come into it, but they do allow for energy to be exchanged with the surroundings. So anything that's a closed system would have to be totally sealed off, but it would still have to be able to have energy put into it or give energy off. If you had, let's say, a pot that's on a stove and you have a lid on the pot, and let's pretend that it's perfectly sealed off, there's no exchange of matter because it's totally sealed, yet the burner is giving heat to the pot. So there is energy exchange, but there is no matter exchange. So that would be a closed system. The last one is an isolated system. And for an isolated system, there is no exchange of anything. So no matter exchange and no energy exchange. And isolated systems would have to be totally sealed off things as well as very insulated. And the sealing off prevents any exchange of matter. And then the insulation prevents any exchange of energy. And an example of an isolated system, although it's not perfect, would be any type of thermos or cooler because those are insulated and their purpose is to prevent as much energy exchange as possible. That leads us into calorimetry. What we have drawn here is a simple calorimeter and a calorimeter measures how much heat is released by a sample when that sample undergoes a combustion reaction. And our setup here contains a couple of those systems that we talked about. First, we have this really large container, which is an insulated container so that is isolated because it cannot exchange matter or energy with its surroundings. So there's no heat leaving the large container and there's no energy or heat coming into that container. And then within that container, there's the sample holder. And the sample holder does not allow for any exchange of matter, but it does allow for heat exchange. So this is just a closed system. And in fact, we really want the sample holder to exchange energy as fast as possible. And what we do is we will ignite this sample so that it starts undergoing the combustion reaction. And that will make the temperature inside the sample holder get much, much hotter. And because it's a closed system, it is able to exchange that energy with its surroundings. So that energy will leave the sample holder and go into the surroundings. And all that blue that is drawn, that is water. So the water that's surrounding the sample holder will start to absorb all of the energy that's being released. And a lot of times there will even be stirs inside of the insulated container. That way, as the water gets heated up, that's around the sample holder, it'll get spread out to the rest of the container to keep that heat exchange as efficient as possible. And as that water heats up, it is not exchanging any energy with its surroundings. So all of the energy that's being absorbed by the water is being contained within that isolated container. Once the sample has completely burned up, 
we can use an equation from the last video, Q equals MCAT, to measure how much heat re was released by the sample because Q is heat. And then within the container, we know the mass of the water. So M would be the mass of the water. C would be the specific heat of the water. And then delta T would be the change in temperature of the water. So we use all these values of the water to calculate the heat that the water absorbed. And that heat that the water absorbed will be exactly equal to the heat that was released by the sample when the sample was undergoing the combustion reaction. And that's why it's so essential that our sample holder is a closed system so that, so that it can exchange energy. And then that our larger container is an isolated system so that no energy is lost. And if both those things are true, then the Q that the water gained should be equal to the Q that the sample gave off. In other words, the heat the water gained should be equal to the heat that the sample gave off. So now let's just work through this example that we have at the bottom. So first just read it and orient yourself. And we know that a sample is ignited in this calorimeter and it increases the water by five degrees and it's a 500 gram sample of water. So the first thing you wanna do is think about how much heat did the water absorb? So we set up Q equals 500 grams times C and C is given to us. So it's 4.186 joules per gram per degree Celsius times the change in temperature, which we are given as five degrees. So we'll practice rounding when we do this because that's how you wanna do it on the test. You'd be pretty safe rounding 4.186 to just four. So 500 times four would be 2000. So 2000 times five would give you 10,000. And double check all of your units. And it looks like we did use all the correct units and that should give us joules. So that is 10,000 joules that it took to heat up 500 grams of water by five degrees. Which remember the equation up here, the heat gained by the water is the same as the heat given off by the sample. So 10,000 joules is your final answer.